Hello, welcome to my talk, which is how to backdoor the Linux kernel. Totally a non-controversial topic, and I'm sure everybody here is um, looking forward to learning how to do that. First, who am I? Right? Um, this is a picture of me as uh, displayed by one of those upload your photo to get a cool shot of yourself. And um, I find it a great illustration for the chat GPT mania, because uh, clearly it uh, did a great job of, uh, <laughs> of representing my likeness there. I live in Montreal, Quebec. I've been Linux admin since 1997 when I first installed Red Hat 5. Not Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Red Hat 5. I'm formerly head of Linux Foundation for the Infrastructure Security. My title changed a little bit. I'm just head of the core IT projects team. I'm in charge of kernel.org for the past 10 plus years. Um, I'm but I like to describe myself as is the keeper of grounds and keys at, uh, at kernel.org. Now, um, a common question that I get is, you know, did anybody ever you know, approach you and ask you to do something nefarious for, uh, because you have access to all those cool things? And the answer to that is, no, they haven't, which I don't understand why, because my rates are really quite reasonable, you know? Um, it's, uh, you know, I'm kidding, of course. Um, please do not contact me because it will be a very short and awkward conversation and I will have to find out how to contact the FBI and whatever is the Canadian uh, alternative to, to use. Uh, so, but, first of all, what do I mean by the back door, right? It's a hidden vulnerability installed by the victim. It's not added by an attacker after they compromise their account because this, or compromise their system. That would be a rootkit, probably. Uh, which allows remote access or elevating privileges uh, or, you know, exfiltrating sensitive info such as, you know, scanning RAM or, or local disk looking for private keys and uploading them to uh, some remote system or, uh, you know, looking for secret docs, that sort of stuff. That's what I mean by the back door. Now, this is not a talk about how to get, how to write back doors for Linux kernel. If you are, if you came here looking for that, then you probably are in the wrong talk. So, um, this is not a Linux, how to backdoor Linux for dummies. This is really about, can you attack the pipeline? Can you sneak in a backdoor into the actual bona fide release of the Linux kernel, right? Because um, there's the pipeline is, pipeline looks like this. You know, there's a submission point where people submit patches. Uh, maintainer receive review the patches, maintainers accept patches or reject patches, in which case there's, you know, uh, usually goes into another one uh, cycle. Now there's a merge uh, part of the pipeline where you know maintainers, or the sub maintainers send pull, pull, pull requests. Uh, Linus usually reviews the Git pull requests and can, he can either accept pull requests or reject pull requests. And then they will merge it into what we call the main line. And then there's a publish point. Uh, Linus tags a release, uh, Greg, Colonel Hartman signs a tarball and then users download that tarball. This is the pipeline of getting a change into the Linux kernel. Now, can you sneak malicious code inside the patch, or can you hack or, or threaten or bribe somebody like me to add malicious code to a patch? Can you trick the maintainer to apply a malicious, malicious patch? You know, can you attack the merge stage? Can you, can you send a malicious pull request to Linus? Can you uh, hack Linus and modify his repo, and, or can you like, make Linus sign a malicious tag? You can attack the, pub, the publish stage. Can you make kernel, uh, can you, Greg, uh, sign the wrong tarball, for example, because that's his signature on the tarball. Can you bribe me to replace a, 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 a kernel with some, something else that's been backdoored? Can you man in the middle a download from a kernel.org? The answer is yes, you can. But, here's where we get into the but. Attacking the patch workflow. So the patch workflow is, for Linux kernel is fairly straightforward. Developer submits code, maintainer reviews the code, maintainer accepts code, maintainer sends a pull request to Linus with the only changes in one nice pull request. Now this is what people think the, the uh, patch submission workflow is like. You know, there is a very uh, rigorous process, which is, is illustrated here by how to get a law in the Canadian parliament, for example, illustrating with the wrong uh, country there. But this is what it's actually like, if you think about it, you know. Uh, it, it, it goes through multiple revisions, it, it gets rejected, it gets sent, some, some subsystems use 
uh, Garrett, some subsystems use GitLab, some but before the code even goes out to um, for review, internally at the company it could use whatever, we don't even know because we don't see that part, right? Now can you overtly send malicious code, right? So write a patch, submit it, uh, and, and try to get it put into the main mainline kernel release. So this is obviously unlikely to succeed for complex backdoors. We're not talking right, uh, stuff like exfiltrating keys or looking for secret documents, because that's just going to be uh, several pages of code that's going to stand out like a, like a log. You know, going to stand out and everybody will notice it. But maybe you could do like a simple vulnerability to elevate privileges locally or, or, or maybe like try to get into the system even though it's firewalled off, something like that. Can you hide complex backdoors inside the humongous patch sets? Huge patch sets are actually not that common, or at least not for the critical paths. And they usually take ages to get reviewed. Anybody who's tried to submit a very large uh, patch set to the kernel knows that the chances of it going through, even when there's nothing wrong with it, are almost none. You know, key case can probably attest to that because he sends those all the time. <clears throat> There are many eyes reviewing humongous patch sets when even they do get through. Um, that it could be really hard to sneak something in there that, that's overtly malicious. Now, can you backdoor uh, a relatively obscure device driver? You can, but you may just as well volunteer to be a maintainer for that driver because people will say, yes, please, just do it. <laughs> but the problem, of course, is that you, know, you have a very obscure device driver that your chance of backdooring anybody would be extremely low and it would be super, super uncommon. So of course here people will always mention the uh, University of Minnesota and the hypocrite commits. And it's really not the best poster case that we have because they were not really trying very hard, honestly. I mean, the, the patches were signed by James Bond, <laughs> one thing. Um, they, they were not good. You know, the people who have actually seen those patches, they, they, they stood out as obviously trying to do something strange. Um, and the whole experience kind of left us stirred, not shaken. It's not, it's not really anything that we can rely on to say, could somebody do it or, or could they succeed or will they fail? Now, so if overtly sending malicious code is not really your best strategy because it will almost certainly get noticed. You know, can you covertly sneak in malicious code into the uh, patches? And this is actually not as crazy as you think, right? The patches get reviewed, but then patches get applied may not be the same set of patches, right? So you may, you may look at your email client, you can see uh, the, the, the code and it looks sane, but then you go to apply it and you actually apply something else because, you know, somebody snuck in something else in the middle of it. Um, usually checks, this is happens like when somebody s sends you a V13, V4, V14 of a revision that they change some, say, well, I only changed a few words here and there, or I'm just based on your previous feedback and you've reviewed it so many times, you just said, okay, that's fine, I'm just going to apply it. That's a, that's, a, that's a way of attack. We don't actually know what you're applying. Now, or, or it's a sub-maintainer who you trust normally, and you would say, yeah, I'm going to take these set of patches but you, it may be actually somebody else posing to be that as a container. Or you can even look like before, for example, we'll check the DKIM signatures, and that actually doesn't mean as much as people think. I'm going to go into that in a little bit later. So end-to-end -end trust. It's like, well, how do you know that the patches that you have received are from the same person who has previously submitted patches to you? That's like with whom you've had relationship going for years and you trust, right? How do we make sure that this is the same person? Now, the DKIM signatures that I mentioned, they're actually super fragile on mailing lists. We just, just now are having a long conversation about uh, some of the mailing list implementations literally just going out of their way to break DKIM. Uh, it requires trust and domain admins. Like uh, if an uh, admin of crawl.org, I can, I can you know, modify any email that passes through my email server. Or oh, anybody at Gmail, anybody at uh, the company mail server. And, and those keys are not usually that well protected. They're just there, uh, readable by the uh, SMTP process because it has to run and access the keys. And it's actually, the most noticeable part is that it's type of squattable, right? If redhat.com versus red-hat.net or whatever it is, and just seeing the DKIM you know, check mark doesn't really mean as much unless you go and verify that the domain matches. And before we'll try to warn you saying, you know what, the from is from this domain, but the, uh, the, the signatures from this domain, for example, or it will say, you know, 
but it's still even for type of squats will not actually alert you. So be, be, be careful looking for that. <coughs> now, something we've recently added to, well, recently, it's actually like three years now, is in um, uh, provi provided a library that uh, can do um, cryptographic signatures for patches sent in. It, is, it adds a separate DKIM-like header to the email messages. So they're actually are completely out of the way. So it's not like a PGP signature, which is just junk all over your, your message body, but it actually signs the from, the subject, and the body of the message, just kind of like, like DKIM does, but the key distribution is very different there. Um, it tailors to patches. It actually works around the, most of the mailing link junk. So there's a appended stuff at the bottom of the, um, of the message, which is common to mailman to mailing lists. We, we, we actually work around that. We can, we can figure out what actually the message was. It can use PGP keys. It can use SSH keys. It can even use directly ED25519 keys. Problem, of course, with any end-to-end -end trust like this is dedicated trust, always super hard. And if you don't do a dedicated trust, then you have to manage your own keys. And that's also super hard in every case. Now, we are trying to fix this a little. Um, there's newer features than before. And by new, I mean they've been there for a couple of years now. People still haven't heard about them. The uh, Shazam feature of before is, is something that you can take the set of patches and turn it into a pull request, a very similar, something very similar to a pull request. You can apply it. So for patches that don't have a cryptographic signatures, what you can do is you can apply them, apply them first, then review them so they're in your Git tree already, and then you merge them. Because this way, at least you know exactly that you've reviewed this code and you've applied this code, it stayed in your repository. It didn't come from different sources. So you know for the fact that you have reviewed it. Now, before diff also is a feature that you can, you can show your diff between series. If somebody says, oh, this is a V13, I've only made small wording changes and comments. You can actually do a diff. Well, show me the diff, the range diff between the v V13 and V12, and it will show you that. So for example, if you notice that it is not actually just wording changes that there is more than that, you can reject it and say, please, you know, what are you doing? The newest feature, of course, is a before send and before prep. Those are the commands that allow you managing uh, the series and patches in your, directly in your Git repository, and like stuff like uh, cover letters and uh, who it should go out to, and V1, V2, V3 of the series, it all streamlines all that uh, management. And also implements the signing of the patches automatically, so you don't even have to think about it. Um, <clears throat> try it out. Uh, I know some people have been using it, but it, the, um, it's only, I can count them with the numbers of both of my hands. There's less than 10 people, as far as I know, use it uh, routinely. And the stuff I hope to work on is the, the keyring management directly in before. So if, you are manage, if you're using before for your stuff, it can do TOFU-like management of keys so, so that you don't have to, um, do go to spend too much effort managing uh, submitters' keys, but you can do stuff like, well, this is the same key this person has been using for the past two, three years and it hasn't changed, so it's probably the same person. But if this person with the same from sending me different, something signed by a different key, that at least it can give me an alert saying something weird is going on. <clears throat> so if a malicious series did get applied, if, if all this failed, right, uh, likely it will still be found out. Um, there, are key, there are eyes watching commits. We know this for a fact. Um, problem is that they may not be talking to us. They may be watching the commits and putting them into their own stash of zero days to use for the future, right? That's the problem. Um, intentional bugs, if you're trying to sneak in a back door and you, you masquerade it as a simple, like a, an overflow or any other kind of vulnerability, it could still be found by a, a CI or, or, or a fuzzer or some sort of integration bot. It's, there's still a danger that this will still not get through because we do have a decent set of fuzzers, this decent set of CI tools that will go out and test change sets to make sure that there is nothing, there's no bugs in it. This will catch intentional bugs as well. <clears throat> so can I, can, can I, a Linux Foundation admin, backdoor a repository? Technically, yes, but I will almost certainly be almost immediately found out. So please don't ask me to do that. Not that anybody's done that. <clears throat> There are tricks to make this more successful, um, like if I could think about it. 
Uh, I could arrange for somebody's laptop to get stolen first. Well, the problem why we found out because, you know, Git, the way Git works, if there is a changed commit, then the next time you try to push your own changes, it will just say not fast forward and it will refuse and then you will know something really weird is going on and you'll start looking immediately, right? But if, I, if, if your laptop is stolen, if I walk away with the laptop, then you don't have a local copy anymore. What you will do is you will reclone the repository uh, all over and then you will not have this weird error coming up. I can be less conspicuous. I can just figure out a way to make your disk stop working. This will be like, oh, my laptop broke. Now I have to reinstall everything and I will reclone everything from remote. That's one way to work around it. There's one way to do, one or the other way to get a fresh clone uh, of the repository. Now, how do you work? How do you fix this? Is by signing git commits. And I, I know, I know, it's super annoying. It, it, I do it to all, of my, to all my repositories and half the time my keys are somewhere. Uh, in, the, in the other pants and they have to go and get them and they get super annoyed at that too. And, and I say, still, please try to remember to do this. This will uh, allow you to quickly check if the repository is exactly the same as the last time you pushed out. This is also true for uh, shared repositories. So there's quite, quite a few now used by subsystem maintainers who multiple people can write to the same repository. There's a way um, to attack this. For example, if you expect that there will be new commits, so before you push something out, you will just do a git pull rebase and not even pay attention to what happened. And then you will push out your own set of changes. If you do check signatures on those commits before you actually rebase, that's one way to make sure that uh, the repository has not been modified. We also publish a transparency log. Um, there have been a couple of articles about that. It, people say it's not a true transparency log because it's just a, basically a Git repository with the record of all the commits. But we do, um, we do replicate it to multiple mirrors, including to non-disclosed locations, which I'll mention also in the next slide. It is tamper evident, obviously not tamper resistant, but if somebody dress, tries to tamper with the, um, with the uh, transparency log, it will be also obvious to anybody who's pulling from it. It can be used to exonerate developers. So if I do backdoor somebody's repository and somebody says, well, you know, in case your repository had a backdoor in it, you will at least can say, I never pushed it. You know, we can look through the, through the log and say, I've never made this commit. So it exonerates you and points the finger at me, which is why I would never do it. So, and always we come back to the same stuff. You know, it's always important to trust the developers, not trust the infrastructure in which it, uh, uh, all the kernel.org stuff resides. Kernel.org has been rooted before. It's been 12 years since that date. There's no guarantee that it won't happen again. There's no guarantee that it hasn't happened again. We just don't know about it, right? Number one rule of kernel.org is do not trust kernel.org. Please don't. We've always, we try to promote the zero trust workflows. The stuff that we do, we try to be end to end. Trust your fellow developer. You know, we just send bytes, we, we store bytes, we receive bytes. Uh, it is your responsibility to make sure that they haven't been corrupted either unintentionally or maliciously. We have tools that we wrote for that specifically. All right, so can you attack Linus? Linus receives a pull request, Linus merges a pull request, Linus tags a release. It's actually probably one of the hardest ways of trying to do this. Um, all pull requests to Linus must be PGP signed. He does check the PGP keys, uh, PGP signatures on the, um, on, on the pull requests. Uh, if something doesn't match, he immediately notices and checks it out. He, we, he has contacted me before asking about somebody's key changes, for example, and we do uh, I do know that he does check this. There is, of course, the problem that we still rely on SHA-1 for Git. Uh, it, we still sort of trust it because SHA-1, there are collision prevention attacks, um, collision attack prevention in the Git code. So we still say we trust-ish it. There are, there's, of course, continued effort to make uh, Git use uh, pluggable um, hashing uh, functions like the SHA-256 and SHA-512 and so forth. But it still is kind of not quite ready to go, unfortunately. At some point it will be. And of course, it's very hard to get into Linus's keyring because he literally, he literally manually manages it. He will add the key only when he's certain that um, some checks have been uh, verified. So can you bribe a maintainer? There's plenty of maintainers here. Can you bribe people in this room? 
Yeah, but also with limited success. They, 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 can, they can only probably backdoor their own patches because if, they, if they're applying and try to, to modify somebody else's patches, almost certainly that person will notice it because if you've ever sent patches to Linux kernel, you, you're super proud of it and you'll be like, oh, yeah, look at my code. And they're like, wait, I didn't, I didn't commit this. I didn't write this. And it will be immediately a red flag and it will be almost certainly found out almost immediately. This can also break CI in weird ways just to, to highlight the problem because the patch ID will change. And then it just, the, the string of weirdnesses will cause more people to look at that uh, patch submission. Of course, it found out that something nefarious happened, it will destroy the developers, the maintainers' reputation. So, yeah, because you'll probably want to target a key subsystem maintainer, not somebody like a, a random device driver. Um, it will also be super expensive because you're effectively paying for next 25 years of their productive work for them to even to agree to something like this. So and there are much cheaper ways of getting anything like this done. So probably not something that we can even consider. Like, for example, hacking their workstation. That would be fairly effective. Um, there's still a high chance that, I mean, we're talking about somebody looking at git commits. People will probably still notice something that goes out, um, but it probably will be caught until it, when, when it's only too late. Uh, like I said, people are watching git commits. They may not be talking to us. Uh, but some of them are, thankfully. It still is only effective for planting in intentional bugs. Like I said, if you try to sneak in complex backdoor code that does something more than just a way to elevate privileges or something like that, it will just be too much of the code and it will be almost certainly sticking out. And even the developer themselves, maintaining themselves, will notice that something weird is happening. So please, protect your workstations. Uh, protect your digital identity above all, and that means your, your encryption keys. Uh, this, um, we do have a program if you're a maintainer that you can get a free um, uh, key fob for store your, storing your PGP key. If you have a, an employer, ask them to get you a better one because the one that we get, can get you is Nitro Key Start, which is a great little device, but it doesn't have a lot of levers, uh, layers of protection. You can get a much more expensive one that is able to do uh, uh, digital signatures. And if you're doing a lot of work, you know, and you're doing a lot of play, try, it's not that expensive to have two different systems. Just, just, just separate your work environment from the environment where you do everything else. So can you attack downloads? Like Greg Hartman signs a release, tags a release, kernel network publishes a tarball, or user, or distro, which is more often downloads the tarball, builds it, and, put, and ships it out. This has also been protected for a while. Um, all the tarballs are signed with Greg's keys, uh, and the signatures are actually part of the Git stable Git repository itself. They're Git nodes that are shipped with the repository. We have no access to Greg's key, so we can't really do this process for anybody other than Greg himself. So curl, we do verify the signature on tarballs before we, we ship them out, so even there's levels of precautions there. So the few times that this did break, uh, there were times when we changed the compression library, which actually modified the, back, the, the tar, uh, tarball itself, like to, to change uh, some of the header uh, information, just literally a couple of bytes. This was noticed immediately and sent to us. So if, if this does, somebody does try to um, replace a, 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 kernel, a, a tarball of the kernel, this will almost certainly raise immediate suspicion and we will hear about it immediately. But just to reiterate, you know, you are responsible. You, and I don't mean you here, uh, all the distro users, uh, distro maintainers who are downloading kernels, please always check the signature on the tarball before you get it, just to give an extra layer of precaution there. We also have a SIG prover tool. Uh, we publish it. Uh, what it does, it runs on the background as a job. It downloads random uh, tarballs from kernel.org from, from a number of mirrors. It will verify the signatures on them and it will immediately send us an alert if something is, um, uh, if it did find, does find something nefarious. That's the, there's a link to the code that runs it. Uh, you can help run it too. I, I run it in a couple of locations that, you know, that, are, that are mine. Obviously, this protects against others. It doesn't protect against me. If you want to help protect against me doing nefarious things, please also run this uh, tool somewhere. Don't tell me about it. So here it gets to the interesting part, you know. You don't really want to backdoor the kernel, and I'll tell you why. It won't be just your personal backdoor. Uh, for every powerful state-level actor, there is another equally or more powerful state-level actor 
who is also paying someone to watch all Linux commit, right? It's like building a shared arsenal of powerful weapons that anybody can launch at each other. Um, it's like shared zero, zero day um, you know, access. If you are not a state level actor, if you're a powerful criminal syndicate, there's another powerful criminal syndicate and they're all banked at the same Swiss banks and you really don't want the Swiss banks to be vulnerable to the backdoor you put in into the Linux kernel. And if you wait long enough, someone will backdoor the kernel for you. This is uh, <laughs> paraphrasing cases, um, uh, KSPP reports, right? And these are all the critical and high CVE uh, vulnerabilities in the kernel throughout the years. And you can see that many of them have lived for many, many years. Um, this is what, literally what I meant. Wait, go back to that one. There's literally, in your kernels right now, there is a, a critical vulnerability that allows local root. We know about it because it was published on the open wall list and the, um, the mitigations will be, uh, it's already fixed in the Git and the, the proof of concept will be out in, on, on Monday. So everybody kernel, in this room, unless you've applied the fix, is vulnerable to local root uh, elevation privileges. The back door is already in your system right now. And paraphrasing Greg again, you know, just wait until a critical vulnerability is fixed. It's not like manufacturers patch their kernels or anything. Uh, so this is uh, also true. That fix and that proof of concept that's gonna be released on Monday will be applicable to billions of devices out there for a number of months, years, we don't know how long. That's the unfortunate truth of um, the, the state of patching affairs in the, um, in the world. Are there backdoors in the Linux kernel right now? Like I said, yes. Intentional backdoors? Probably not. And I say probably because there's no proof. We can't offer you any proof. So despite the perception of that this is a bazaar and, and it's really all big mess that the Linux development has done, it actually is, is very quite rigorous. There is a lot of code review, a lot of eyes looking at the Linux kernel code. There is a transparency and oversight at many, at many levels. The pre-commit, obviously maintainers are not interested in sticking anything nefarious because it, it's bad for their reputation. Post-commit, there are people looking at git commits uh, and, and, and just reviewing kernel code because it's, um, it's part of somebody's job probably. Like I said, being a maintainer is a well-paying job with very long-term job security. You know, it, bribing a maintainer is super effective, probably inefficient. Um, there are cheaper ways of rooting somebody. Again, having a root on kernel that org infrastructure gets you almost nothing. Anything weird or strange or nefarious you can do will almost certainly be almost immediately found out by the members of the community. Unintentional kernel um, backdoors, like I said, everybody here probably has one uh, known backdoor on their system right now. And I, I wrote this before the news came out, so I was prescient, I will point out. Now, just because it's not known to us, it doesn't mean that the, the future backdoor, uh, future vulnerabilities are not known to bad guys right now, right? Um, and bad guys, if you're watching this, you know, if, what if it's known to your worst enemy, right? Um, will it be used against you? Probably. Let us know about it. It's in everybody's interest. There it is, security at kernel.org. Send a little note. It can be completely anonymous if you want. That's it. Um, thank you for um, attending. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Hi, uh, could you describe the community issues that the free tooling work group is trying to solve and what's the roadmap roughly to get there? The issues that we're trying to solve in the community? Sorry, I don't quite. Uh, the, the free tooling workshop the or working group. Free tooling working group? Yeah. I'm not entirely sure what that means. Um, two months ago, you posted uh, my grand plan to put uh, together a free tooling working group at the Linux Foundation that would look like. Oh, yes. OK, I see what you mean. Uh, this is not entirely related to this talk, but, but I will say that w w this talks about the work that we're doing on B4 and public inbox and uh, the other bot integrations that we've done. We've done the Bugzilla bot integration very recently. It's still trying itself out. So what we want to do at the Linux Foundation is instead of it being a bit of a you know, skunk works effort, okay, I'm, I'm a system administrator for Linux 
for, for, for fairly wrong infrastructure, but uh, what I actually end up doing 60, 70% of most of my weeks is writing code to, to help out developers. So instead of it being kind of like a, a juggling of priorities every week, I want this to be a dedicated effort by, um, by, by members of Linux Foundation who are paid to literally make developers' life easier and to help secure the, um, what we call the, the, the pipeline of code revisions going from the developer all the way through to the Linux kernel release. So that's the, yeah, the, that's the tool chain, kind of like the tooling. I, I, I've had a number of names in my head, which is why I didn't quite ring the bell. But yeah, that's the, um, that's the goal. Um, it, it still remains a goal. It, the, there's been no developers, development since a couple of months. But I would like this to happen, just so we, we actually continue working on this as a dedicated effort, as opposed to whenever we have time. Thank you. Have you talked to any of the top level maintainers about um, basically uh, requiring use of your tool set for submitting to them? Yeah, how do you see that happening? You know, you know I, I could, yeah, you know, I, I recommend everybody to use this. I try to make this as out of, you know, out of, out of your face uh, as possible. You know, they're, they're, if you once set it up, it should continue to work. The problem is that, in, well, uh, can I enforce this? You know? So you can't, so I guess the, the key is, can you convince a Greg or someone somewhere on Greg the too nice to, you know. <laughs> to, to do so? Well, well, case is here probably the base scenario, right? He, he does use it, and I'm not sure if you require people sending code to you to use it, but he'd recommend it. Right, so um, if, if we can make case, make you know, and make an example of him, that sounds bad. But uh, <laughs> I, I'd make him a, a sort of the model to follow. How about that? So maybe that's a, that's a case there. But um, uh, I don't think as a administrator of Kernel I can enforce this. But yeah, I definitely would recommend everybody. I, I wrote a ton of docs. Uh, problem with writing docs is that then people have to read them, and that's the hard part. Anybody else? Is everybody hungry? Three, two, one. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>